This Photography News podcast is sponsored by MPB. There's never been a better time to make good use of your kit. Inspire others, make some extra cash and make a difference. Sell your used kit today at mpb.com forward slash sell and let someone else love it as much as you have. On this episode of the Photography News podcast, Roger loses his mojo, Will burns some flowers and Kingsley tries a new camera. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Photography News podcast. My name is Roger Payne and I'm the editorial director here at Photography News. And as I'm sure you'll have already realised, our big news in this particular podcast is that we are now sponsored by the lovely people at MPB. Um, They have very kindly agreed to sponsor the uh, PM podcast for the next 12 months, which means, you lucky people, that you get to listen to us for another 12 months and you can decide whether that's a plus or a minus. So moving on very quickly, I am, as usual, got with me today, contributing editor Kingsley Singleton. Hi, Kingsley. Hello. How how are you doing? I'm, I'm very good. You're no doubt delighted by our MPB sponsorship. I am. I'm wearing my MPB T-shirt and waving my MPB flag, and they're made of recycled lens cloths and bits of old camera straps. And also joining us, as usual, Mr. Photography and the editor of Photography News, Will Chung. Hi, Will. Hi, guys. How are we doing? And can I just say, never mind MPB T-shirt and everything else. I've got MPB boxer shorts as well (laughs) and socks, so I'm well on brand. Are they also made from recycled lens cloths? Never you mind what they're made of. Lovely to have you both along. And uh, as as I say, thanks very much for MPV for supporting us, although they're probably rethinking that right now <laughs> after that introduction. So let's get straight on to it. So uh, Kingsley, uh, you've, been, you've been having a little bit of an interesting time since we last chatted. What have you been up to? I, I've been out and about with the brand new Fujifilm XS10 doing a bit of testing, a bit of wandering, a bit of shooting, um, quite enjoying that. Um, and, I'm only managed to take it out sort of fairly locally, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really enjoying it. So this is a pretty important camera for Fujifilm, from my understanding, in that I think it's sort of, it's a bit of a move away from their analog style dials and switches, is it not? Or is it, and it, plus the fact it's got a bit of a hefty hand grip on it, right? Well, yeah, the, the, the thing that I think is probably most noticeable is the hand grip, and it feels much more like a small DSLR. And I think that's kind of the people that um, Fujifilm are trying to attract, quite possibly. Um, but I mean, other than that, I, I don't know. It, it, it's still got that aesthetic. It doesn't look like an SLR. It still looks like a kind of a, you know, a, a, a sort of neat and tidy kind of vintage camera. Um, and you've still got sort of lots of things like manual inputs all around it. Um, People that are familiar with Fujifilm will recognize that you have things like exposure compensation dials and ISO dials and stuff on the top plate. This has got two dials that are customizable. So, you know, you can set it up to do that if you like. Um, and then it's just got a kind of an MASP dial with a load of custom settings on it, which is quite good. There's four custom settings that you can put into this. So, you know, you can set it up for lots of different sort of shooting styles that you might like to employ. But overall, apart from the things that having tested previous Fuji cameras kind of come to expect like the, the image quality is very good the colors are lovely the build quality is really good actually for a kind of quite a sort of a, I mean it's, oh, can, can we call it an entry level camera it's, it's kind of it's below other cameras in the range but it still feels really solid um, but yeah it's the hand grip that I'm actually really liking because I'm not actually a Fujifilm user and I do enjoy the cameras but I always like to get back to my DSLR with that hand grip. And this actually kind of solves that problem a little bit. And Will, you've had you've had hands on with it as well. Latest issue, I think you've got some coverage, haven't you? That's right. I mean, we had uh, pre-production samples prior to launch um, and I really enjoyed using it, actually, because um, that Kingsley's mentioned the hand grip, but the Fujifilm themselves has mentioned it a lot. And it is a very, very good hand grip. And it is aimed at people who maybe currently at this moment in time aren't Fujifilm users, maybe they have been put off by the, the traditional look of their cameras. So this has gone a bit more modern in that respect. So I think it will appeal to Fujifilm and non-Fujifilm users. And I, I thought it's tremendous. The quality is, you know, it's stunning. It's off you know, the same sensor as the X-T4, same processor, great handling. Um, it made a nice little combination. And even though it's not weather resistant, I did take it out in the rain because we've had a lot of it recently. And it was fine, you know, but I was very impressed by it. 
something else I like is the is the round. The EVF has got a round uh, shape to it. I don't okay. like. I've got, I've really gone Why? off the, I, well, it's pretty Arthurian. Just, What's that just, all about then? <laughs> it's just a personal thing. I kind of. I've always liked the round um, viewfinders on the Nikon's that I use. I was um, going to say, is that? Do you one. reckon that's a nod towards Nikon users? It could be <laughs> like a little bit of attraction. <laughs> okay, well, good stuff, Kingsley. I'm glad you've uh, I'm glad you've got acquainted with it. I'm looking forward to trying that out for myself. And now, what about you, Will? Um, we, you've been telling as we were setting up for this, you were telling us about your home studio, or rather, your living room home studio. Is that has that been your mainstay of what you've been shooting recently? Well, I have been doing a lot of stuff at home. I mean. Um, I've had cameras to review as well. So I've had the Panasonic Lumix, Lumix S5. That's been a fun to use. Just getting the grips with it, really. It's um, very different menus from, from what I'm used to. I've also had the Canon EOS um, R6, which is the, the lower resolution brother of the R5. And that's still that's a very impressive camera. But in terms of what I've been doing in the living room here in the studio, yes, I have been taking pictures. I've, for instance, I've got a light pad which is um, inspired by a talk I heard at the uh, the virtual the photography show. And I bought one of those. I've been doing photographing flowers on it. But the studio, I've got, the reason I've got the studio set up at the moment is, is that I've got a couple of printers here. I've got the new Epson Surecolor SCP 900. And I need to take some pictures of it. And so I've had to set everything up just to take pictures of that. But it, it's fine. I mean, it's it's good fun. It's good fun sitting for the printer. And it, it's where it really won't, to be fair, with the weather it is as it is at the moment. And also the... The COVID situation, being at home printing is no bad thing. Tell me a little bit more about this light panel then. So what is it? Is it is it how big is it? Is it is it quite large? Well, it, it's quite large in that you can buy the different sizes. So I bought an A2 one, which is the 59 centimeters across. And it's basically like a very thin light box. It's got LEDs in it. And it's um you just lay it on your table and power it up and then you put subjects on it. So it's, they're backlit and you set your camera above it and you shoot still lives and arrangements wherever you want. I mean, it's used by people like architects, you know, doing copying things like blueprints and things like that. So I bought it, it cost me 50 quid. I thought, what the hell, I'll, I'll do something different in the evening. And I've been going to a local supermarket, buying flowers, ripping the petals off and just dropping them down onto the light pad and taking pictures of them. When you get, you do that when you get home, yeah? You don't do yeah. it in the shop. <laughs> <laughs> it passes the evening. <laughs> so what was fun. that? What was that other gadget you were waving around in front of us before we started recording? Something about microwaving stuff, was it not? Yeah, I bought this thing called a microfleur, which is basically a flower press that you put flowers in. Microfleur. <laughs> <Yeah, microfer. laughs> <laughs> that you uh, you put flowers into it and you put them into the microwave to dry them. Okay. And again, it's part of my drive towards keeping myself busy with the light pad and also the, the some dried flowers. Um, I'm just getting the hang of that at the moment. I've I've burned the first few buds I, I put in there. <laughs> they went very brown, which is very embarrassing. But also, I mean, at the moment, the leaves are dropping off the trees and on the cricket ground near me, there's some nice red, don't know ask what type of tree it is, but it's nice orange leaves. I've been going out there, picking them and picking them up and drying them off to shoot some still lights with. What's the benefit of that? In turn, is, is that just about drying it quicker? Because I know obviously people have dried leaves for for countless millennia and normally they do it in you know they just crush sort of flatten it in something heavy and then sort of wait for it to dry itself out is that is that just about speed absolutely i mean this, this takes 10 20 30 seconds whatever it is um i find the only thing is you have to take it gradually because you you can as i found burn flowers very easily and certain flowers work well and certain flowers don't from what i've read and this is a bit of fun i mean um i haven't done anything great with it yet but it's you know the start of something but it's that in the light pad, it just keeps me, keeps me occupied photographically in the evenings um, because of the situation outside currently. And the weather's not very good either. Indeed. Well, um, I can I can certainly agree with the fact that the weather's not been very good because following on from our last podcast where I, I think I talked, didn't I, about the fact that I, was, I go out regularly in the morning with my dog and I'd seen some lovely pictures, but I'd not actually had a camera with me to capture them. So for the last whoa, couple of weeks since we last recorded, I've made sure that I've powered up my battery and taken out my camera every morning. <laughs> and do you know how many pictures I've taken? Absolutely none. <laughs> not, not a single picture has been taken because the weather has been appalling for a start. It seems to have just rained every morning. Um, it's also now getting quite dark in the morning. I'm going out at like 7 a.m. and it's and it's still pretty um, still pretty dark at that point. But the other thing is, and I know this is something that 
I've certainly talked to Kingsley about it in the past, is that I am really, really struggling with the whole idea of why I'm actually taking pictures. Is it to record something that I'm seeing or, you know, what is it? I, I'm struggling with what I'm going to do with it in the end. Um, and so I'm kind of all over the shop, really, in terms of like why I actually want to take a picture. What's the purpose for me taking the picture? Which and I think is something that like Charlie Waite touched on when we spoke to him. It's not unusual, I think, to kind of question why you're doing so. Photography serves different needs, doesn't it? Like both the record making and the kind of the, the process of it, you know, bo both of which are perfectly valid reasons to take pictures. I mean, are, are you thinking more about why, wh what are you going to do with them or? Yeah, I, I think it is kind of a little bit about the what I'm going to do with it at the end. And, um, you know, because one of my other great, uh, you know, loves is playing golf. And like you, a lot of people might go, well, why on earth do you play golf? It's just a, the famous quote is it's a good walk spoiled, isn't it? But actually, it's because I get exercise because the, on the odd occasion where I hit a, a shot that goes straight and is quite nice, you know, that I get a lot out of that. Mm. Um, and plus, the fact I play with my son who's away at uni and I don't get a lot of time to spend, you know, t time with him. So there's a number of different boxes that I can you know emotionally I can tick a box and sort of satisfy myself that I've actually achieved something with my time um and maybe yeah maybe I'm just in this sort of um this sort of hinterland of not really kind of understanding what photography means to me but uh, clearly you two aren't going to help me out <laughs> <laughs> you could have something to do with the fact that you could have something to do with the fact that you know you're the, the uninspiring conditions I mean when when you haven't had a camera you've been inspired to take a picture haven't you this is true. It's just, it's been rubbish. Roger, you're being a bit unfair on yourself because all you're doing is taking the dog out for a walk at the minute and yeah. you've had bad weather, but you can record the bad weather, but, you know, maybe you should go for a more serious walk in the same way if you go to, you know, you want to play golf, so you go to a golf course. But if you went down to a local wood for a nice walk in the autumn colours, for instance, you may suddenly find there's lots of photograph. I mean, it's difficult having to take pictures to order when you oh, I'll just go take the dog out for a walk and I'll take my camera. Well, I, I shall persevere with taking the camera out because, of course, the next time that I don't take the camera out will be the next time that there'll be a beautiful sunrise or something. Yeah, so, um, nice or something as well. Yeah, exactly. And there are also there all are also some wild deer that are roaming around our house as well. So, of course, typically what would happen is they would probably run across about six feet in front of me, and obviously I wouldn't have a camera. Um, but um, well, there we go. Anyway, so um, let's not let's not <laughs> linger on that too long. But let, let's. Um, move on instead to uh, an interview that I carried out with Matt Barker, who is the CEO of MPB. Um, as part of the sponsorship, we thought it would be great uh, to have a chat with Matt, who um, set the business up in 2011, and it's gone from kind of strength to strength. Um, I'm sure that a number of uh, PN podcast listeners will also will already be very familiar with, uh, with MPB. But if not, um, and if you want to know more about how the uh, how the business works, then um, listen to this next segment because it is some really, really interesting stuff coming up. Obviously, MPB, I would imagine, to a lot of photography news readers is a, is a well-known business, but perhaps not everyone. So do you want to sort of start by kind of encapsulating what MPB is and what you guys do? Sure. MPB is now the largest platform globally uh, for photographers and videographers to buy, sell and trade their kit. Uh, we have been around since 2011. Uh, we started live as a UK only platform um, and then shifted more uh, internationally from sort of the end of 2016. So certainly we've got the longest history in the UK and we're most we're most well known in the UK and I'm sure lots of your readers um, will have either bought, sold or traded with us in terms of what we do for people. So we have, I think, the broadest choice, the biggest range um, in terms of what's offered on the platform and what we offer to buy from people as well. So you can sell or buy one of around 6,000 different products now in our database. Um, which is primarily biased towards uh, the digital era and post in terms of interchangeable lenses and cameras. And yeah, in terms of um, our role in the market now, we very much you know, see secondhand products playing an increasingly important role um, as in the future of kit. Uh, I think the evolution of the new market um, has slowed a little. I think there's still some interesting things going on. And obviously there's lots going on with mirrorless at the moment. Um, but we are certainly seeing people look to um, the secondhand market more and more. And, and when you when you launched in 2011, 
what did you set out to achieve? What did you recognize as being a, an opportunity in the market? Um, when, um, when e-commerce kind of took hold in this industry, eBay was really the, the primary place where people were looking to buy or sell kit. Um, and, you know, eBay can be a great place to do that. And on other days, it can be a place where you don't quite get what you expect um, or you can run into issues. It's, you know, there were less protections around that peer-to-peer -peer market in what is an industry where we're talking about very high value products. So I very much saw a opportunity to expand the, off the offering online and offer a platform that was dedicated to the secondhand market in the UK um, and offer a proper full service e-commerce experience for people looking to buy, sell or trade at a time where frankly no one else was doing that other than, other than eBay. I mean, I've actually bought and sold kit now for 18 or 19 years. I was buying and selling kit prior to that 2011 date and I was doing that very often on eBay. And indeed, it was always a risky experience buying on that platform, which meant that you could, you would see products selling at different prices. Um, so certainly, we, I also saw an opportunity to make sure that there was a platform where photographers were offered kit at the correct price, um, both in terms of when they're buying kit and when they're selling kit. And that's something that we've obsessed around for a long time is making sure that people are getting the right value for their kit, um, whether they are selling or buying. Um, and also making sure on the buy side that we offer a warranty and the protections and, and people fully understand the item that they're getting. So, yeah, so you're, you're kind of offering complete peace of mind, I guess, to people who are, who may not have considered used before. Yes, um, we are. We're quite obsessed around imp constantly improving the experience for people, whether they are buying or selling. Um, there are all sorts of nuances about any given product, um, which I think often get overlooked in the private market. So. Um, you know, how many shots a camera has taken, whether a camera does or doesn't come with a particular accessory that it did come with new, mm -hmm. exactly what physical condition, cosmetic condition is an item in. You know, we've, we've invested a lot of time and a lot of money over the last few years in technology to make sure that every single product that gets bought or sold on the platform is correctly described and correctly priced and that the buyer really understands what they're going to get, what they're going to receive and what that particular product is. And um, yeah, we are still working on that and still looking to improve that. We've got a new platform coming out um, next year that will do that even better and encapsulate even more of that kind of detail around why a product should, should cost what it costs so that people can really make that choice on the platform. You know, some people are less fussed about the cosmetic condition of an item and, and more fussed about just getting, you know, really super value and you can get that on the platform on some people prefer um, absolutely mint kit all the time and, and, and can easily identify that on the platform. And obviously there's all sorts of condition grades in between, but we have the biggest database and, and um, strongest history in terms of being able to really know what products are worth and why they are priced where they are. So we'd certainly give that confidence, I think, in the buying experience where others don't, you know, every single product that we uh, process through the platform whether it's worth 10 pounds or 10,000 pounds gets the same treatment everything gets photographed multiple times tested by our technicians um, both in terms of you know is it doing everything it should do but also how does it look what does it come with and we do that at scale now for tens of thousands of different products every month and obviously you as you've touched on at the beginning there you know you've gone from 2011 starting in the UK you're now over in the US so clearly you're, you're doing something right, very right. So what, what, you know, when you started, what sort of size of the, of, of stock did you have compared to, I mean, you're alluding to now that you've got thousands of products. What, what's the, what are the comparisons there? Yeah. It's tens of thousands of items a month globally that we, that we process. So it's been a really interesting and, and enjoyable journey for us. And the thing I think I'm most proud of in that is that whilst we are a large company, um, we are, I would say better at doing what we do today than what we were right back at the beginning. And I think many businesses fail through the scaling period in terms of continuing to look after their customers. And that's something that we've really, really kind of put central to everything that we've done as we've scaled. And you know, we built that early business on a strong reputation, really looking after people, giving good service, giving people time, taking time to understand people's decisions around kit and advise people. And I think as a business today, um, at, at the size that we are, we still have a phenomenal reputation. We still have an NPS above 80. We still have the strongest record on Trustpilot, on reseller ratings, on all the platforms around reviews. And it's been really important to us to make sure that 
we've continued to look after everyone even as we have scaled as a business so that you know, we want photographers to benefit from the fact that we've scaled in terms of choice on the platform and driving value into the market as well because obviously the more kit that you buy in terms of volume it does tend to drive down prices as well and that's for the benefit of photographers and um, but we also wanted to make sure that if you were buying or selling on the platform today the experience is better than it was all those years ago and you still feel looked after by us and, and presumably you've also seen quite a dramatic change in that time about um over the sort of the the what is most popular in the market so originally i presume when you came in it was very much dslr Mm-hmm. Um, now I presume you're seeing, or are you seeing, a, a much sort of stronger move over to, to mirrorless and uh, and also to cine. Well, I think that's the wonderful thing about the secondhand market is that you do see demand for all product because ultimately there's something for everyone. I think we're all aware as photographers that the price of new kit has trended upwards, somewhat ahead of inflation, to say the least, <laughs> over the last few years. And you know, it is it's an expensive hobby certainly today and what we are here for is to make sure that you know there is something for everyone at every price bracket so that everyone can enjoy photography um at any entry point essentially so you can still buy and sell a nikon d100 on our platform which is years and years and years old um they only resell for i think about 30 quid um but we still take them in and we'll still trade them through all the way up to as you said uh, you know just now like high-end cine kit um, and everything in between nowadays obviously it's much more of a question you know the key question in the market is one of you know mirrorless or dslr and to be honest with you i think from our position as a company like as i said it's about something for everyone and yeah. i don't kind of enter that debate because it's a personal choice with photography and kit is a personal choice. It's, it's an expression of creativity and your kit enables that creativity. And what we really want to see is people trying everything and either you can afford it or you can't. And if you can, it's about kind of choice and experimentation and kind of getting out there and getting different shots because the secondhand market enables you to try a far greater range of kit than perhaps the new market does. It's an amazing market because you have got this backwards compatibility on lenses and therefore as photographers you can you can have the latest you know canon r5 or whatever but ultimately you've also got the options over kind of this huge back catalog of of lenses to attach to that camera i think that's really great and i think um i think i would encourage all photographers to really investigate the second hand market if they haven't done so before because i think if nothing else um it could open up a new area of creativity because they may find that they can afford a particular lens a type of lens that they're kind of lusting after which um, they wouldn't be able to if they just looked at the new sure. market. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. How how old will you go? Will you sort of go old, like sort of old, old sort of Rolly Flexes or Leica M's and stuff like that? So if somebody goes up into their loft and dusts off an old camera, you know, potentially you will be interested in buying that from them. So I think on the on the camera side, um, we don't go much beyond the DSLR era. Okay. We do you can sell like a range of range finders, so M2s through to M7s, um, but we aren't at the moment able to offer uh, on the vast majority of other uh, film equipment. It would have to be DSLR onwards primarily, so kind of 2003-ish onwards okay. in terms okay. of bodies. Uh, certainly on lenses, um, we go back a lot further. Um, we still buy the entire canon ef range and um all nikon f mount etc so you're talking more like kind of 1988 89 onwards in terms of lenses and obviously on leicas and other other brands that goes back much much further in time so okay and and you do you also um accept or sell any accessories of any of any form or is it is it purely cameras lenses no we do we have quite a long tail of accessories um it's from those early days, even even prior to founding MPV, when I used to buy and sell kit on eBay, um, an observation at the time was that obviously when people are selling, sometimes they'll be selling whole outfits. So they'll be selling, you know, a couple of bodies, three lenses, a flash. And then they may also have, as we would know, you know, a, a, a pretty expensive rucksack, a tripod, a set mm-hmm. of filters, be that Lee filters, things like that. And actually there is value, I think, to be found all the way through the photographer's kit bag. And it's always, again, been an important um, thing that we've held on to here, which is to say, actually, if someone is looking to sell um, a broad range of accessories alongside, say, the core items of, of, of lenses and bodies that we will look to price 
as much of that as we possibly can because you can often extract quite a lot of value there and that's obviously better for sellers so yeah there is a an enormous range of um, photographers uh, bags that you can sell on the platform uh, we do the vast almost the entire historical range of manfrotto tripods um, you can buy and sell leaf filters some hoya filters uh, remote switches uh, all the kind of core speed lights and things like that so um, yeah, I, I would, I would be, I would hazard a guess that our database has got some in excess of a thousand different accessories that can be sold as well. So. Yeah. And actually, I was going to, I was going to ask you a little bit more about the actual process of selling because I think uh, certainly myself and Will and Kingsley, all the guys who who uh, are on the PN podcast, we've all uh, sold something to you at some point over over the uh, over the years, and I think we've all found it a remarkably easy to do. Um, but also, um, I've personally the I think a couple of items that I sold to you, um, I discovered that actually I put in what I the condition that I thought it was in, and by the time you guys had got it, you actually said no, it's actually in the be in better condition than you said. So fantastic honesty. I mean, do do you find that that happens a lot that people underestimate? No, it does happen frequently. Yeah, some people are more conservative in how they consider their kit, you know, in terms of condition, or they don't want to be disappointed. Um, and have it downgraded on arrival so therefore they're so conservative that actually it needs upgrading when it gets right. here and obviously sometimes um when when people are selling we do have to move the price down slightly as well it does vary but overall statistically um 80 of transactions will go through exactly as quoted and 20 percent of transactions there may be an item that has an adjustment on it um, but that item um, could go up or, or could go down. The team um, in our warehouse in the UK, in the US, and the one that we're building in Germany at the moment as well, they are trained to assess the item in terms of its functionality, you know, assess what it's with and assess its physical cosmetic condition. And then the system will tell them, you know, what that is worth. And it is not, this is not some, there's not a human intervention on that in terms of, you know, oh, well, this is better than we thought, but, you know, we can, we can, we can pay anything less than what the system says. We will always pay um, the correct price um, according to the technology that we've built. Um, so yeah, um, glad to hear that you got upgraded and and <laughs> no, it's 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 not unusual um, because um, we do honestly want to offer people the best kit. We want people to go away happy, and certainly giving people more money does make people happy when they're selling. And is there an easy way for somebody who is coming to your site and and trying to be uh, honest about the condition their product is in? Is there an easy way for them to recognise? what products it's in sort of straight away or, or is it is it down to kind of like a bit of a personal, well, I reckon this is in good condition? It's something that we've talked about uh, a lot here because what we don't want to do is have an overly complicated approach to kind of assessing something's condition because then we're asking too much of people when they just want to get a quote. Um, mm. We are very picky about how we place the condition on an item, which is why people end up getting upgraded sometimes. I think odds are that we'll, we will say it's in worse condition than the person selling it um, nine times out of 10. So therefore people shouldn't be too scared of kind of looking at our condition grades online and, and coming to a reasonable um, assumption of their own and what and where theirs will fit. Uh, we have, you know, like new, excellent, good, uh, well used and heavily used. Like new needs to be like, like, like new. It needs yeah. to be brand new. Um, you know, it can, done a, it can have done a few shots, but you want to feel like it's, it's fresh out of the box and, and you can barely barely distinguish it from new excellence not a million miles behind that um so an item that's that's not been used much at all but might have one small mark on the corner or just a slight degrading of coloration or something that kind of just you look at it and say well it's not quite brand new but it's not far off you're talking kind of 90 percent of of new condition if not better really um you know cameras that have done say less than 10,000 shots would mm. generally fall into that category for example good is that you know used but not heavily used is the way i would describe it so kind of something that you've had for a couple of years and shot on relatively regularly but not abused um yeah. would be something that would kind of sit into that category where maybe there's a couple of small marks to the screen if it was a body if it was a lens maybe there's a small chip in the paint but you know a small one one maybe two um and you know a few scratches to the lens hood that sort of thing um, and then you get down, as I say, to, to well used and heavily used, where cosmetically these are items that have um, been well loved is the best way to describe it, I suppose. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and as we say, like, you know, we love to see items that have been used and we love to give them new life again. Yeah. And um, I do love the fact that, you know, photography kit lives for a very long time. And, and that's true of bodies and lenses. And, um, and we, whilst we don't, we won't buy anything that doesn't work, we won't buy items that have 
you know, an issue with them in any sense. But we will buy items in sometimes, you know, relatively well used cosmetic condition because, again, it offers a degree of value in the market. And if you look at the discount on the more heavily used end in terms of the cosmetic con con uh, condition, it does offer um, a significant difference. You know, you can be looking at 50% less than an item that's in excellent or like new condition, which um, for some people suits them perfectly because they use their kit heavily and it just offers great value. So, and, and you offer the same level of warranty on something that is well used as you would do on something that's as new? We do. We offer six months warranty on a £10 remote switch. We offer six months warranty on a £10,000 600ml. Everything gets that warranty. Um, and we will stand behind that um, if it will either get it repaired um, for the for the customer um, or if there was some significant issue and um, we would simply replace it within that. Okay. And you mentioned there a £10,000, 600 mil. What, what is, uh, can you say, what is the most um, valuable or most interesting thing you've ever been offered as uh, for sale? Uh, yeah, I mentioned, uh, I think that £10,000, 600 mil kind of came to mind as an analogy because we do have a 600 mil Mark III on the site at the moment, which... Uh, Canon, which I think is interesting actually, because it does show again, just to make the point that you know that is the latest uh, Canon L series 600 mil. It's ten thousand pounds from us, it's thirteen thousand pounds from everyone else, and that one's in brand new condition. I think it's a really good representation of what you can get from us because we do, you know, whilst we we buy kit that goes back a long way, as we've talked about, um, we also buy the very latest kit, and you can find everything on our platform. To answer your question, though, we obviously we've been doing this for a long time, and you know, we're, we're, we're north of a billion pounds now in terms of quoted value of kit in the market. So we've quoted a lot of people for a lot of different <laughs> stuff over yes. the years. And therefore, we've seen um, loads of interesting stuff as well. Sometimes people um, choose not to sell it. Um, but certainly we've been we've been offered some really rare kits. Um, we've been offered lots of you know, special edition Leicas and things like that over the years. We've also been offered some of the rarer um, Nikon fish eyes that we rarely see any more of these days. Um, I think one that kind of sits in my mind, I guess, um, was the uh, uh, the Canon 1200mm um, f5.6. I think there's only 10 of those in the world. Um, we had one of those back in 2014, um, which we bought from a photographer in South Korea, actually. And we actually sent over a couple of our guys to go and expect that in, in South Korea and collect it in person. Um, back in 2014 and, and enjoyed um, spending some time with that lens and shooting on that lens. Um, we did a couple of um, content pieces with it at the time um, and um, actually ended up, uh, which I don't think is, has ever been said actually, but we actually ended up retailing that. That was actually bought by B&H Photo in New was York. Was it really? So when B&H in 2015 were shouting about having a 1200 mil, they actually bought that from us. So that went on <laughs> quite a journey. It went from... Um, uh, two, two of our members of staff who uh, went to pick that up in South Korea to spending some time in London and Brighton to then I actually delivered that to B&H um, in, in New York who bought that from us so that was that was an interesting journey and an amazing lens actually an amazing piece of um, engineering yeah. so um, but yeah we I mean it's not I don't think it's the most expensive thing we've ever sold because we do do quite a lot of cine kit now and even on the platform now out in the states we've got some $80,000 Aries and things like that but you know that's modern tech that happens to be expensive because cine kit gets expensive and i still think it's interesting but for me i think some of those rarer kind of pieces where they were made a long 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 time ago but they were still amazing and i think you know, look at lenses i mean they haven't really changed much in terms of of how they're manufactured now for like for decades and there's not many um items out there that we as consumers buy where you can kind of say that and um and yeah i just think they're really interesting for that reason and um, maybe one day we'll see that 1200 mil again you know that's what, something that again i love is that we'll see we track serial numbers obviously through the business and we'll very yes. often see the same item be that a camera or lens passing through mpb you know, sometimes you know 10 15 times as it's been cycled <laughs> around to, to different people um which i think is interesting as well because every yeah. every bit of it goes on this little journey and um, they're all being bought to go and shoot stuff with. So they've all been on these, you know, journeys all around the world um, on, and, and had amazing experiences. And I think um, I just, I'm really fascinated by that. And sometimes you can see it, you know, you get lenses in that might have a flight case on them that's clearly, you know, been all over the world and done some Olympics and done some World Cups and sure. done this and that. And, and it's still there and, it, and we're just going to, you know, give that another lease of life again for, for a photographer. And I think that's really, really cool. So, so, so one final question um, that would be obviously, so you've come an incredibly long way in nine years. 
Um, what does the next nine years look like? Obviously, you've already alluded to building some new tech and, and opening the, the warehouse in Germany. Is, is, it sounds like global domination is but a few years away by the sounds of it. <laughs> no, we're, honestly, um, we think about what we want to do for our customers more than anything and continuing to offer great value and great access to kit. Um, I'd love to see you know, photographers changing their kit more regularly. Um, because MPB exists and then that in turn kind of fueling the creativity of what they do. So yes, we are investing heavily in new tools and ways that people will be able to access the kit on our platform. Um, we are really looking to kind of take our sell experience and our trading experience to the next level next year and improve that in every single way that we can, both in terms of speed and value. And you know, we will continue to expand as a business in terms of the number of customers and in turn, therefore, the breadth of kit that we have on our platforms. And that can only be, again, for the benefit of photographers and videographers who use the platform. So less about domination and more about, honestly, just wanting to be the most positive place in the, in the market when it comes to kit um, that we can be and, and really looking to help people on their photography journeys. And you know, I said earlier, we, you know, for a start, we offer, you know, an entry price point for everyone. Um, and, you know, that's, that's really important, I think, um, as it will bring more people into the hobby. Um, and as we continue to expand in the UK and the US and Germany and the rest of Europe, um, you know, we're obviously reaching more people and, you know, through our content as well, you know, really sending out um, really positive, very inclusive uh, content um, in photography that's another important role that we're looking to play in the market and expand upon over the next few years so from a consumer standpoint um, it should just be seen as you know more of the same but always getting better you know we're, we're, we're not going to stop if you know until we well we won't stop trying to make the experience better we won't stop trying to make photography more affordable um, and we won't stop trying to make sure that we have the platforms with the biggest choice of kit and and something for everyone so um, you know, and um, I'm really looking forward to doing that and continue to expand the business. I'm, you know, I'm also an entrepreneur at heart and I've really enjoyed the journey that we've gone on and I'm looking forward to, you know, continuing to improve that experience and continuing to work with some great people in kind of delivering what we do. Really. Well, Matt, thanks ever so much for your time. I really appreciate you taking the time to chat to us and obviously we wish you all the very best with MPB going forward. Thanks so much. Thanks okay. for having me. Okay, cheers. So there we go. Really interesting stuff from Matt there. Hopefully that's um, um, answered a few questions that you may have about MPB and about selling secondhand. But but gents, I mean, we're, we're big fans of, uh, of of selling stuff secondhand and buying stuff secondhand. And it looks like Matt's making uh, quite a nice little uh, quite a nice little business out of it. Will, I know you're a big fan of MPB as well. You use them quite regularly, don't you? Yeah, I had some good experiences with MPB, you know, most notably before I went to Venice last year. And I was just thinking what I was going to take, and I suddenly realised I fancied a medium format telephoto zoom. And um, I just went on the website, googled around, and found a used one, and it just happened to be MPB. I didn't plan it as that; it just happened to be there. And I, I basically got a quote. Um, I was okay with the quote. It was picked up by courier the following day. And this lens, I mean, it was literally a week before I went to Venice, and I got this lens two days before I went. So it's remarkable service. So yeah, I, I love the idea of um, getting rid of old stuff. I mean, you know, I, Kingsley's very bad at, it, bad at it, I know, and so am I, but I just hoard stuff. And some stuff I don't use anymore. I mean, how many cameras can a boy use? And certainly some of the lower resolution, older cameras, which, um, I, you know, in the past, I've had the odd one converted to infrared, and that's fine. But how many times can you do that before you end up with a body where you think, well, what am I doing with it? Um, and let's do something with it. And MPB being very fair, that they're giving me good prices. And the fact is, I don't have to do anything. I can do it all on the keyboard at midnight, whenever it might be. They can pick it up within a day or two. I don't have to leave the house. And that is even before any lockdown or any any pandemic. So I was even getting lazy before then. It's just a convenience of it. And once I've used once I used it, I thought, hey, this, this works for me. I'd agree with what Will was saying about it being a great way of getting rid of stuff. Um, I've actually not, I don't think I've actually bought anything off um mpb obviously i've bought secondhand cameras before uh, uh, some of which were off wheel they were terrible um <laughs> i bought a um i bought a i bought a d700 years ago off someone on ebay and that that turned up in a in a right state and i think basically using a company 
um, to do that just takes a little bit of the worry out of stuff because mm. you know you have got comeback, you do have guarantees, um, and it's kind of the same with with the um, what you know Will was alluding to about the process of selling stuff. It all happens very quickly and efficiently. You're not phoning someone up asking where your money is or anything. Mm. Um, and I think I think that was something that um, Matt touched on in the interview, wasn't it, about making people happy being the kind of like the um, the, the basis of a good business it's it sort of weirdly it kind of reminded me on I used to when I started work my first proper job I think was in the stockroom at Argos in uh, in <laughs> South London and the kind of um uh I remember the guy the manager saying to me he said oh, what's what makes Argos special and I was like I don't know it's cheaper than other places is it or something um and he said no it's about customer service yeah. And I was, and yeah, it's about making people happy. And I obviously thought, well, I'm not very happy, but that's what I'm working. <laughs> not on these wages. <laughs> but you know, that was a kind of, you know, they, I, I guess they faced some difficult times in a changing market with online shopping and stuff recently. But you know, they were successful for a long time based on basically keeping people happy and offering good sort of value as well. Um, the one question I, I would have asked Matt as well, I suppose, is how much money he's taken off Will in the, <laughs> <laughs> in the history of the company operating. Yeah, that's probably part of the reason why they're, they're they're doing quite successfully. All they're doing is they're potentially plowing the money that they took off Will back into sponsoring this podcast. Thanks very much, Will. You, you, you sponsored your own podcast. At least I could do. This Photography News podcast is sponsored by MPB. Use their free online valuation tool to instantly find out exactly how much your gear is worth. Get super fast payments straight into your bank account, and if you change your mind at any point, up until you get paid, they'll ship it back for free. Okay, time to answer some reader questions which have been sent in. Uh, the best way to get in touch if you've got a reader question, and we'd love to hear them from you, is podcast at photographynews.co.uk. If you also have a question, you can also use social media to get in touch with us. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and the handle for those is at photonewspn. And while we're talking of all things digital, it would be remiss of me not to mention the fact that, obviously, we've got the website, photographynews.co.uk, where you can read all the latest news um, and also you can read the digital issue of the magazine which is uh, all 82 issues of the magazine are up there on our digital archive and you can you can look back and see how Will's hairstyle has changed over the last <laughs> X number of years if you want to do um, if you've got nothing else better to do um, so basically first first question chaps um, comes from a chap called Peter Webb who's in Harlow and he said I was inspired by your autumn podcast, which was the last one round, uh, but it's been pouring down in, for the last week. So have you got any advice of what I can do while sh or for shooting in the rain? So, Will, what about you? Um, well, one of my projects happens to be uh, people using umbrellas. So that is a, it's a good example. I mean, it's, it's difficult at the moment because we're not getting out with the freedom uh, we once had. But I mean, for me, that's the only time when I can shoot my project. So it's it's heaven sent in some ways, this rain. Just at the moment, I'm not in that particular frame of mind. I'm into nature. So one thing I have been doing is still is wandering around, taking pictures of leaves on the ground, um, lugging the tripod around, doing some focus stacking as well, or focus bracketing rather, do focus stacking afterwards. Although that's quite difficult because it's been windy as well recently. So you're into a 30, 40 exposure a bracket and then there's a puff of wind and you think oh great I'm going to start again so that's been quite frustrating and of course there's lots of fungi around to be had as well at the moment although it's wet but that's that's what makes it kind of quite fun and useful too you just have to be prepared and we discussed it briefly last uh, last podcast when we talked about knee pads and black bags to kneel on and that sort of thing but um I think things like fungi are rather fun and yeah time to get the macro lens out yeah, on, on top of that, I'd say kind of um, wet conditions are going to be more easy, make it more easy to get reflections. And there's a lot of colour around to reflect. It's a good time of year as well, because, um, you know, I, I think, as again, as we said last time, um, blue hours are a bit more accessible. Um, you know, you've got autumn colour, you've got you've got earlier evenings with re uh, reflections. Um, you've got, I mean, little details like Will was talking about about you can find spider webs with droplets in them stuff like that you know that's a a good one and again like we were saying about sort of collecting leaves um you don't just have to sort of shoot them in situ something i've done over the years is is 
is, is find a, a decent, nicely, brightly coloured leaf, so put it into a kind of a shallow tray and fill it with water and then put it in the freezer. And then you can shoot still lifes backlit, possibly with a, a light panel or, or, you know, certainly something that doesn't melt the ice too quickly. Um, and then you get some sort of interesting results that way. The other day, there was a fantastic storm here. We could, I looked out the window, I could see these wonderful clouds. The sun wasn't shining at the time. I saw these wonderful clouds. I thought it was going to rain soon, but I thought, oh no, I'll get out, get my Mac on and everything else, get my waterproof ready. And went out and I saw this front coming in and all this rain you could see approaching me. So it was fantastic. The skyscapes I was getting, all these clouds were bubbling up. I could see moving towards me, this wall of rain. And I got all these pictures and then suddenly it did rain. But I got these stunning pictures. And and amazing thing was within 10 minutes, the sun came out, had a rainbow. So mm. Peter's got a good point. It is raining, but yeah, okay, if it's consistent, rain on a very dull day like today it's difficult but sometimes the conditions change really really quickly too and again like that that sort of chimes a bit with what you know we're saying about the idea of taking a camera out with you doesn't it it's it, half of the process is about lingering around hanging around <laughs> waiting for something to happen you know the great the great the great secret skill of landscape photography being there being waiting there. observing you know finding a composition and then actually watching the light come towards you until it's right and then take the picture and then you look for something else or you wait for different light and it's kind of plenty to invest in so so we're recording the podcast on a slate gray uh <laughs> day such that it is now so so on days like today i guess that what peter would be best advised to do is either photograph something indoors like frozen leaves and stuff like that or concentrate on details outside so things like fungi leaves on the ground basically anything that doesn't include having sky in but then yeah. on other days get out there and get the waterproof on and away you go yeah but i mean also like like i said the um the low light aspect of like wet weather as long as it's not actually raining too hard and you can protect your lens a little bit um blue owl looks quite often looks better um during kind of you know after it's rained anyway so it's kind of and it, and it doesn't make any difference to the color of the sky that much you know because it's going to be it's going to be that kind of cool tone anyway you don't you don't need it to be a clear sky and just for those people, Kingsley, who don't know what blue hour is, the the hour sort of after golden hour. Although golden, I was reading the other day, golden hour is not really an hour, is it? I, I sort of came to appreciate that. Over golden hour can sometimes be like fifteen seconds. <laughs> yeah. It's just the the point at which something might happen. But you know, the kind of when 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 the kind of the the direct sun has left. You know, obviously there, there is that 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 sort of period between, or you know, it's not. It, it, there's a period after sunset where where it's stuff is still warm in color isn't it but then yeah. then there's a period after that where it, it gets that kind of cool tone but it's also prior to sunrise as well right so it, yeah. it's not yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so it's at either end well, I, i'm i'm never up for that so i've no idea. well no <laughs> but, <laughs> but you might start well i might start seeing the blue arrow with out with the dog at seven o'clock in the morning certainly as, as we uh, as we move further into winter okay great well that's uh, hopefully that's given peter some uh, some useful hints and tips um and the next one we've got is from Anthony, who's in Highgate, Anthony Bryant in Highgate. And he said, um, I've got a bit of a dilemma. I can't decide between a long telezoom or a telephoto lens. I'm looking at the Canon 100 to 400 or 300 mil F4. Which, guy, which one would you guys recommend? Now, Kingsley, as a user of a 300 mil F4 yourself, presumably you're going to advocate that, that Anthony goes for that one, right? Well, I, I am. I mean, I'd also say, you know, if you live in Highgate, it's by both. Probably got enough cash. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm sure there are different parts of Highgate. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that based on my limited knowledge of those two lenses um, and not being a Canon user, I, I can't vouch for the for you know for having tested the, the quality of them i mean the, the 100 to 400 gives you a lot of flexibility but you've got that variable aperture um the 300 mil is lighter probably smaller um you know so a bit more portable and i i mean again i, I don't know the prices but i i would hope that you know possibly you could spend a little bit of money on a uh, possibly a second hand teleconverter um and attach it to that 300 mil f4 and then you've got a 450 e5.6 sure. um, you know so you've got a bit of option for versatility there what do you think well, will well just to help you out i was going just before you jump in there will i, I was just going to say to help you out there so the 300 mil is about 500 grams lighter mm. um and uh, it's about 
uh, five, six hundred quid cheaper. Will, thoughts? Um, well, swings and roundabouts. It depends what he, what he wants to do, to be honest. Um, I like the idea of a fixed focal length lens, but then the versatility of the 100 or 400 will make me sway towards a zoom. It depends on your interests. And, you know, for instance, if you're an aeroplane photographer, for instance, something like a zoom like that would be fantastic. But I think for the, the sheer versatility, covering a range where you can shoot portraits with 100 or 400 at one end and then go for a lovely aerial perspective at the other end and all in one particular lens. So it costs a bit more and it's a bit heavier. But on reflection, I'd probably go for a zoom. Interesting. Outrageous. So one for the one for that. the one for the prime, one for the zoom. You've got um, a casting vote. Have I? Okay. Well, based on pre my previous form on the podcast, I'm clearly going to say um, the prime uh, no. because that's uh, <laughs> that's proper photography. And and as we know, Will's going really soft about this because he was advocating to super zooms a couple of podcasts ago. So um, plus I'm the still fact, there, Rog. I'm still there, mate. <laughs> yeah. I've not bought one yet. <laughs> having been a canon user in the past i have i did own a 100 to 400 and it is actually a cracking lens but it is quite unwieldy um and i actually remember uh trying to shoot sport with it once and it was a a day similar to today it was quite wet quite overcast and that maximum aperture was uh, a bit of a hindrance when you've got it zoomed out to the sort of 300 400 mil um, but it's uh, definitely the 300 mil f4, I think, is the casting vote from the PN <laughs> podcast audience. Uh, audience? Panel. So, finally, I think we, we, we're probably about ready to wrap this all up. Thank goodness, says everybody. Um, but we wouldn't end a podcast without having a Will's word of wisdom. So come on, Will. Regale us with your knowledge. Well, just a simple tip. Next time you're out shopping, dear listeners, head towards the outdoor shop. Just going back to what we're talking about with the bad weather and this time of year, go to a local outdoor shop and pick up a couple of things. One is a small microfiber towel, um, very useful to keeping your camera dry if it gets wet. And the other thing I got recently was um, a small rucksack cover. So it's not so much for the camera bag, but it's actually to stick over the camera and it's on the tripod. So often I'm shooting with the camera on the tripod and it might start raining. And I just keep the camera on the tripod and put this thing over it, keep the camera dry while I move from A to B. It's not necessarily something you use while you've got the, it's, it's not like a waterproof um, enclosure for a camera, so you use it and shoot away, but it's a protection measure. And uh, other times I use it is when I'm at this coast and it's a lot of sea spray around, which gets into the camera and the lens and everything else. When I'm not shooting, I just put this on over the top. It's great. Local outdoor shop, bargain. Boom. Fantastic. So how much how much do those two cost you? Waving them around in front of us, Will, what do you reckon cost was? I reckon it cost about 25 quid for the towel and the and the rucksack cover. That's not too much money to spend to keep your money. camera kit protected, is it? Absolutely. It looks, um, it looks a lot, it probably looks a lot better than the shower caps that I tend to use. <laughs> <laughs> do you steal those from hotel rooms? I do, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Good, to know. Good to know that nothing's changed there. No surprise. <laughs> well, uh, thanks very much for your time, chaps. Hopefully um, you found this uh, a, a useful podcast. Um, do get in touch with us, as I, as I said earlier, podcast at photographynews.co.uk. So that just leaves me to say thank you very much to contributing editor, Mr. Kingsley Singleton. Thanks, Kingsley. It was a pleasure as always, and I hope you get your mojo back, your camera <laughs> tackling, camera, um, your photography mojo. I should say. <laughs> That's very much easy for you to say. Yeah. Um, well, we'll be back in a couple of weeks, so I'll, I'll, I will update on my mojo. Um, and thanks also, Mr. Photography and the editor, Will Chung. Thanks, Will. A pleasure as always. I'm going to go press some flowers. See you. OK, um, we'll see you again next time. Cheers. This Photography News podcast is sponsored by MPB. Enjoy contact-free doorstep pickups which are safe, convenient, fully insured and completely free of charge. Plus, with a quarter of a million customers and five stars on Trustpilot, you can trust them and sleep easy. And does it rack out? The, um, does it extend the front element on that? 
it's a trom- yeah, it's a trombone style. Yes, yeah, you're going something. to be getting some smart ass going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, of course. Yeah. Well, and if not, then obviously you can invert insert your own amusing comedy soundtrack yourself, couldn't you? But um, but that, I, I'm not sure that's a reason not to buy the Zoom though, King. <laughs> What, the, what is, is the uh, current one? Sorry, I haven't handled one, so I haven't seen the current hundred or four hundred. But isn't the Mark II not a trombone? Oh, uh, right. Style okay. lens. Oh, should we, we just cut all this bit out? Are we, guys? <laughs> are we supplying some tough information? Uh, oh, I don't know. Anyway, okay, well we'll cut that bit out. <laughs> I'll just get the scissors in there. <laughs> I'm sure it'll seamlessly blend in. It doesn't look like a trombone, the Mark II. Okay, well, apologies it's not, for that. It's not brass coloured. <laughs> so you can't do brass instrument jokes. Never mind. Okay, well, I think we got there in the end. So, um, Anthony, hope you found that answer vaguely useful.